Today we're out in the Hamptons taking a look at the all-new 2017 Volvo S90. Up front we have a design that is modern but obviously very Volvo. We have an interpretation of the Volvo grille that was seen on Volvos before. It's a little bit concave right there. Large Volvo logo in the center. We also have the 360 degree camera in this particular vehicle. So there's a small camera right there below the Volvo logo. We have the standard LED headlamps now in the S90. An interesting change is that for 2017, the XC90 is also getting standard LED headlamps rather than starting out with halogens. At 195.4 inches long, this is about five inches longer than an S80. And that makes this very firmly an E-Class, 5 Series, and A6 competitor. In fact, this is actually two inches longer than the Mercedes-Benz E-Class, which is all new for 2017 as well. It's also two inches longer than a 5 Series and one inch longer than the Audi A6. As you'll notice on that chart right below you, the Lexus GS is one of the smallest entries in this particular segment. The big difference between the S90 and the S80 is very visible right here because you'll notice this has the proportions of a rear wheel drive vehicle. We have that long hood up front, then we have a big distance between the wheel and the front of the front door. Volvo did that very deliberately because it makes the S90 look a little bit more elegant and much more like the other entries in this category. In fact, the front wheel has been pushed about seven inches further forward versus the previous generation. The extra length helps the S90 look definitely more elegant than the S80. It also gives it a slightly longer trunk lid, which helps out the proportions on the side of the vehicle. From this angle, the S90 looks considerably wider than the S80, but it's mostly an optical illusion because this is actually only about one inch wider than the previous Volvo S80. A lot of it comes down to the design of the rear end and the way these tail lamps wrap around the vehicle, helping it look lower and longer and wider. Personally, I'm a little bit torn about the rear end styling. I like the effect of making the car look lower and wider and meaner than before, but it does look just a little bit unfinished to my eye. Let me know what you think about it down there in the comments section down below. One thing worth noting is that in the United States, we don't get amber turn signals, we do get red turn signals. That's definitely a design choice only because there's no particular reason to skip the amber turn signals in the United States. There's one basic engine design for all S90 models that come to the United States, although Volvo works them into three very different drivetrains. All of Volvo's brand new engine designs are based on a displacement of half of a liter per cylinder. That means that we get two liter four cylinder engines in all the S90 models coming to the United States. Unfortunately, Volvo's tasty new diesels are unlikely to come to this country. Things start out with the base T5 engine, which is turbocharged only, and that produces 250 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque. For the moment, that model is mated only to an eight-speed automatic transmission and front-wheel drive. We then get the T6 engine design, which is still two liters and still has a turbocharger, but it adds a supercharger in addition to the turbocharger. That engine produces 316 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque, still mated to the same eight-speed automatic transmission, but this time it gets all-wheel drive, sending power to the rear wheels. The range topping S90 will be the S90 T8 all wheel drive plug in hybrid, but we don't expect to see that until next year and not all the details are final. That will use essentially the same plug in hybrid system from the XC90, which is already available in the United States. It builds on the T6 model that we're looking at right here with a supercharged and turbocharged engine and an eight speed automatic transmission. And then on top of that, it adds an 87 horsepower motor in the rear and a slightly smaller motor right here under the hood. Volvo then stuffs a 9.2 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack in the tunnel of the vehicle so it doesn't occupy any trunk space. With everything working together, that system equals about 400 horsepower and 472 pound-feet of torque. Fuel economy ranges from 27 miles per gallon combined in the front-wheel drive T5 trim to 25 miles per gallon combined in the all-wheel drive T6 that we're driving right here. We don't really know what the mileage or range figures will be like on the T8 plug-in hybrid yet, but you should expect to see right around 28 to 29 miles per gallon in that T8 once the hybrid system has completely depleted that battery and about 20 miles of EV range when the battery is full. When it comes to front seat comfort, the S90 scores very well for this particular segment. This is essentially the same seat design in this model that we're seeing in the XC90 as well. In our trim, we have the extending thigh cushion, four-way adjustable lumbar support, and adjustable side bolsters. One interesting touch is that we still have a manual tilt telescopic steering column in the S90, whereas most of the entries in this particular segment have a power adjustable one that's linked to the seat memory. As we see in most European luxury vehicles, but unlike what we see from Japan, the front passenger seat moves in exactly the same way as the driver's seat, and it also has a two-position seat memory. When you look at the combined legroom figures, this is a full inch ahead of the BMW 5 Series and the Mercedes-Benz E-Class for 2017, just about in line with the Audi A6, which has one of the most accommodating rear seats in the segment. We also have a generous amount of headroom in the rear. If I lean back in the seat, my hair is not brushing the ceiling, and the sunroof is standard in all American-bound S90 models. If I move on over to the middle seat, 
My hair is brushing the ceiling, but my head is not touching the ceiling. That means we actually have more headroom in the back of the S90 than your average family sedan in America. The middle seat is also where you'll notice how much wider the S90 is than the S80 that preceded it. It's much easier to put three adults across the back. If I move all the way over to the right side, I have about three inches of legroom left behind this front seat that was adjusted for a six foot five passenger. We're in the top end inscription model, so we have window shades on the side, but we don't have a window shade on the rear window. All models do get a softly padded center armrest with a storage cubby, cup holders right there up front. We also have a ski pass through and the rear seats fold down. There's an electric little latch right here, and then they fold manually down. This allows you to put large items from the trunk into the vehicle, and the opening is just about as large as the average family sedan in America. Inscription trims also get four zone automatic climate control. This is something that you don't generally find in this category. Although it may sound confusing, there are a variety of different ways of measuring trunk capacity. So depending on how you measure this trunk's capacity, it comes in either at 13 and a half cubic feet or 17 cubic feet. That means this is either one of the smaller trunks in this segment or one of the largest trunks in this segment. It all depends on which testing standard you use, and there's no requirement that a manufacturer use a particular standard when advertising their numbers. So if you look at the public pages on Volvo's website, they'll list this particular trunk as a 13.5 cubic foot trunk, which is only a little bit bigger than the S60. But in person, it actually is quite a bit larger. You'll notice that it's quite deep. We also have a spare tire under this cargo area load floor, which is a little bit different than we see in the S60, which was not designed to accommodate a spare. Obviously, we won't know how this fares in our typical bag test until we can get our hands on one for a week. We do have an optional power trunk lid. As we take a look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end inscription trim. You can tell that because we get inscription embroidered right there on the headrests. The inscription model that we're driving has not only heated but ventilated front seats, and you can see we have that extending thigh cushion I mentioned earlier. The leather is also an upgraded softer Napa leather versus the base model. As you'd expect from a luxury vehicle in this category, the front doors are composed of all soft touch plastics. So even this lower portion of the door right here is a soft touch plastic. And then we have a rubber liner to that little storage cubby right there in the door. Most of the door is a stitched material cover. So we actually have a stitched pleather piece right in here and then stitched leather on the top of the door, real wood trim over here, the perforated grills for the up-level Bowers and Wilkins sound system and a soft touch armrest. As with many vehicles in this segment, you'll notice the front seat moves back further than the front door. So we actually have a small cutout right here on the B pillar of the vehicle to give you somewhere for your elbow to go. That B pillar is also a soft touch material. It actually is covered in the same fabric that forms the headliner in the S90. Moving from the front door on over to the dashboard, you'll notice that we have a theme that is similar to the XC90, but not identical. So the up-level Bowers and Wilkins sound system has this same speaker grill and speaker right here in the center of the dashboard. Very similar look, but the overall shapes are not actually the same. As with the doors, the dashboard is either stitched leather that we see up top or soft touch plastic that we see below this metal trim. We have a large expanse of real wood trim. It's open pour trim, very much like we see in the XC90 as well. And then we have a large bin style glove compartment with an extra slot right up top where you can put things like the instruction manual for the vehicle. You'll notice that unlike the XC90, this actually uses a real mechanical latch, not an electric one that's a button on the dash. One of the big differences in style between the S90 and the XC90 can be found on these large air vents that are on either side of the standard census infotainment screen. Instead of a typical knob lower in the dashboard to open and close the vents, we have this little knob right here on the vent itself. We rotate it to the right to close the vent, rotate it to the left to open the vent. This also allows you to move the vent up and down and side to side. The touchscreen infotainment system is standard in all models of the S90 coming to the United States. It looks very much like a tablet computer grafted into the dashboard, and it's just about the same size as the original iPad. We have a home button right down here at the bottom, and you'll notice the screen is divided into four different zones. We have navigation right up top that brings up the navigation display. We have our media, which is still loading. We have our phone, which is connected through Apple CarPlay right now. And then of course we can go back and we can choose Apple CarPlay itself. One of the unique things about this particular CarPlay implementation is because of the orientation of the screen, because it's this portrait orientation, not a landscape widescreen format, the Apple CarPlay screen does not actually occupy the entire screen. That means that you can actually still see the vehicle's navigation system, media, if you're playing some other media source, phone, etc., right here, even though you're also seeing the Apple phone interface. It means that you can adjust your temperature, right there on top of the Apple CarPlay interface that makes it a little bit easier to interact with the vehicle systems while you're using CarPlay 
in the vehicle to either navigate, do your messages, do your audio, that sort of thing. Below the infotainment system, we find a line of buttons that's exactly the same as we see in the XC90. We have our hazard light button, front defogger, rear defroster, track forward, backward, play, pause, and then this is a volume knob that rotates around. The only difference between this and the XC90 is again that we don't have the glove compartment release button right over here on the right because it's now a mechanical button over there. Working our way down from that, you'll notice we have more stitched leather on the center console. A traditional console shifter, drive us all the way down, manual mode over to the left, up for up and down for down. We also have a small storage cubby right in front of this area and a large cup holder right behind that wood slider area. Two large cup holder areas, an area where you can put square drinks or square juice boxes, a 12 volt power outlet is right there. In an interesting twist, Volvo will also wrap their smart key in wood if you so desire. This is part of the inscription package, we're told, but you can opt for the wood trim on the base momentum model as well. It actually matches the wood veneer in the vehicle. To the left of that, we have our engine start stop toggle. Turn it to the right to start, to the left to stop the engine. Drive mode selector right down there. We can select between Eco Comfort, Dynamic, and Individual, which is adjustable, electric parking brake, and auto brake hold. The center console is essentially shared with the XC90, so we have a leather-wrapped center console armrest. This opens up to reveal a storage cubby with the optional optical disc player, two USB inputs, and an auxiliary input. Closing that lid again, you'll notice that our model has the optional four-zone climate control with independent zones for each of the rear passengers. As I usually say, heads-up displays are notoriously difficult to film in vehicles, but we do have one in the S90. It operates very similarly to what we see in the XC90 and very much like the other entries in this segment. All models come standard with a digital LCD instrument cluster, but the size changes depending on the options and the trim that you select. Base models of the S90 come standard with an 8-inch screen. The model that we're driving right here has a screen that's just a little over 12 inches and very similar to other top-end luxury models. You'll notice that we have a digital speedometer on the left and a digital tachometer on the right with navigation and other information between the two dials. If you get the 8-inch screen, then we have a single dial and it has auxiliary information around that single dial, but it's a little bit less fancy than what we're seeing right here. The steering wheel is essentially the same as the one in the XC90. We have sport grips right up top, and you can have it in a two-tone leather design that we're showing right here. We have controls for our radar adaptive cruise control on the left, which is standard. On the right side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the infotainment system. This button controls the trip computer right there in that LCD instrument cluster, and then we have a voice command button. No new Volvo would be complete without a bevy of brand new Volvo safety systems and the S90 is no different. But the S90 also charts some new territory for the luxury segment because this is the first vehicle in the luxury segment in the United States to include semi-autonomous driving technology as standard in every vehicle. That's because Volvo is also bundling the radar adaptive cruise control equipment, sensors, etc. in every model of the S90 and that also is unusual in the luxury segment where even full-size luxury sedans for $100,000 don't buy you radar adaptive cruise control standard. In addition to the radar adaptive cruise control, we also have the lane keeping assistance system that was seen in other Volvo models as standard, road departure mitigation standard, so, so we'll see if you're trying to veer off the road into the bushes, try and guide you back into the lane. The Volvo City Safety System has also been updated for the 2017 model year. The City Safety System started out by trying to detect cars and keep you from rear-ending them, and then it tried to keep us from turning into cars at left turns at lights, and then it started detecting pedestrians and then cyclists and now it's finally detecting large animals. So this is the first car sold in America that will detect moose, elk, and deer. Of course, deer are probably the big target for American drivers. And this is something that really could save my father because he's probably bagged more deer with his cars than the average hunter in the United States. We then have driver alert monitoring, which is monitoring how I'm driving the vehicle in relation to the road around me. And it's trying to determine if I'm sleepy. It'll let me know that I need to pull over and rest. And then we have the Volvo Pilot Assist System, which is quite unique in this segment. The the system first debuted in last year's Volvo XC90, but the big change for 2017 is that they've increased the speed limit. In the XC90, it only operated up to 30 miles an hour. Now it's good for 80 miles an hour, and it will try and provide the majority of the steering effort for you, whether there's a car in front of you or not. So I can actually let my hands off the steering wheel just a little bit, of course, and then the car will keep us in the lane. Volvo is calling this a semi-autonomous system, not a fully autonomous system. So this is not the same as the Tesla autopilot system. Volvo does require you to keep your hands on the steering wheel, and if you take your hands off the steering wheel for more than about 10 or 15 seconds, it'll beep at you, remind you that you have to put your hands back on the wheel, and if you don't, it'll actually cancel the system. 
Pilot Assist is trying to augment, not replace the driver. So this is gonna try and help reduce driver fatigue from seesawing the steering wheel on the roads. It's gonna provide a little bit of extra effort in order to help keep you in the lane, but this is not meant to replace the driver. In our preliminary tests, this T6 all-wheel drive model ran from zero to 60 in 5.8 seconds, which is just a few tenths of a second behind the 535i, the Audi A6 3.0T, or the upcoming expected score that we should be seeing in the new E400 when it finally launches. The T5 version of the S90 is going to be just about as fast 0 to 60 as most of the base 2 liter turbocharged entries in this segment, with the exception of the Lexus GS200T, which is actually a little bit slower than the norm. Volvo puts fairly wide tires in all models of the S90. This starts out with 245 with tires and ends up with 255 with tires if you get the top end inscription trim with either engine. The wide tires help this vehicle stop from 60 miles an hour to zero in 110 feet, which is an incredibly short stopping distance for this segment, especially considering how large and how heavy the S90 is. This actually stops quicker from 60 to zero miles an hour than the comparable 535i Audi A6 3.0T, or again, that Mercedes-Benz E3. Out on these winding New York roads, the car feels fairly nimble, although this is not as well balanced as the rear wheel drive entries in this segment. If you're after the best handling options in this segment, that would actually be something along the lines of the Cadillac CTS, the Jaguar XF, or the Lexus GS. All of those models really have a strong focus on handling and rear wheel drive dynamics. Volvo has yet to release final weight balance specifications on the S90, but it wouldn't surprise me if this was slightly better balanced than the Audi A6. It all has to do with the way the Quattro system is designed and the fact that the entire engine is hanging out in front of the front axle in the Audi Quattro system, and this engine is more or less on top of the front axle in the S90. The best way to describe the way this car feels out on the road is confident. This is not a lightweight stand, doesn't feel like it's being tossed around on the road. This weighs just over 4,200 pounds as we're equipped right here, so it definitely has a solid, substantial feel out on the road. But thanks to the wide 255 with tires, it also feels like it can go around the corner with a great deal of confidence. The only model that Volvo has had to test is this top-end inscription model, which does get not only the dynamic suspension system, but the load-leveling rear suspension, which uses two airbags in the back. This is not the same suspension that we see in the Volvo XC90, although they are related, because the XC90 uses a full four-corner air suspension, very much like we see in Mercedes-Benz and Range Rover models. Instead, the air suspension in the S90 really is dedicated to load leveling the vehicle, so when you put three people in the back or a lot of cargo in the trunk, the S90 still drives the same way as it did unloaded. It keeps that suspension in its middle point that really helps improve the suspension dynamics. The dynamic suspension does get definitely firmer when you put the vehicle in dynamic mode, softer when it's in comfort mode. Even in the comfort mode, however, this is not going to be as soft as something like a Cadillac XTS or a Lincoln MKS. Those vehicles have a more traditional American luxury sedan ride. It's definitely going to be softer than what we see in this Volvo. The Volvo has more of a traditional European style ride, so we can definitely feel road imperfections, bumps, etc. but this handles larger bumps relatively well. Although we haven't been able to drive the S90 on our typical test course, we did score 69 decibels out here at 50 miles an hour. That definitely makes this one of the quieter entries in the segment. The road noise is particularly well controlled in the S90, even though this does have those wide tires. Even though we have been doing a great deal of city driving out here on Long Island, fuel economy has been excellent in this vehicle. We've been averaging 24.1 miles per gallon, which is among the best in the segment. To give you an idea of how the fuel economy compares with the competition, this ends up being an awful lot closer to the competition's 240 to 250 horsepower options, two liter turbos, rear wheel drive, than the all wheel drive, three liter turbocharged options that we see from the competition that are also producing about 300 horsepower. So with the S90, you can get that 300 horsepower, you can get that faster zero to 60 time, but still get fuel economy that's much more similar to the competition's base models. For 2017, the S90 starts at $46,950. That would be for the front wheel drive, T5 model. That's very well priced in this segment, but you could get a Lexus GS200T for about $1,000 less than the Volvo. Of course, you're going to get about $2,000 less equipment in your base Lexus GS versus the base Volvo S90, but the GS will be rear wheel drive and will have a slightly different driving dynamic. The GS is one of the best handling vehicles in this segment. When it comes to the European competition, the Volvo is easily the least expensive. This is $600 less expensive than an Audi A6, 
Key thing to know about the A6 is that the base model is a front wheel drive vehicle with a two liter turbocharged engine under the hood as well, very much like we're seeing in the base T5 version of the XC90. Even though this is less expensive than Audi A6, it comes with a decent amount more standard equipment, including the standard radar adaptive cruise control, the city safe braking system, and all the other safety features that we've been taking a look at in this particular model. Compared to the BMW, this is $3,800 less than a BMW 528i and $5,200 less than the all-new Mercedes-Benz E300. If you'd like to get all-wheel drive, that only happens in the T6 model that we've been taking a look at, and that will set you back $52,950 starting. A fully loaded model like we've been looking at here will set you back about $66,000. Value has long been a strong suit of the Volvo brand, and that continues for the 2017 S90. The base trim is very well equipped as far as base models go in this segment, and it is also one of the least expensive. But I think the best value in the S90 is the fully loaded T6 all-wheel drive model that we've been taking a look at here. Again, this tops out right around $66,000 before the destination charge, and that's considerably less expensive than some of the competitors' vehicles. The closest competitor in terms of overall pricing to the top-end version of this would be the Lexus GS350 all-wheel drive, but it's not gonna be quite as fast as the turbocharged and supercharged version of the S90. There are also considerably more gadgets available in the S90, including the new pilot assist system, the much smoother operating radar adaptive cruise control, the eight-speed automatic transmission that we get in this versus the six-speed that you still find in the all-wheel drive models of the GS. Where the Volvo really starts to shine is when you compare this to the rest of the European competition, however, because compared to the Audi A6 3.0T, this is not going to be quite as fast, but it's going to be significantly less expensive, right around $10,000 less expensive. I think the interior is actually nicer than the A6. This also rivals the A6 in terms of trunk and passenger room on the inside. The A6 was tweaked a little bit last year, but it still looks just a little bit less fresh than the S90 or the brand new Mercedes-Benz E-Class. BMW's 5 Series is due for a complete redesign very, very soon, but at this moment, it's already $11,000 more expensive than this Volvo right here when you comparably equip a 535 with all-wheel drive. Again, admittedly, this is not going to be quite as fast as the 535i. It's not going to have quite the same balance as a rear-wheel drive vehicle either significantly less expensive, however, right here. Volvo's radar adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assistance systems are just a little bit smoother in the S90 than in the 5 Series. We have that pilot assist system, large animal detection system, and on the inside, we get Apple CarPlay and very soon Android Auto support as well. Even though the Volvo is one of the least expensive entries in this segment, this interior is easily one of the best, especially in this top end trim with the leather stitch dashboard, this open pour real wood trim, and just the overall design and attention to detail. We get this stitched leather center console, all the plastics within reach are soft touch, all the plastics on the doors period are soft touch plastics as well. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise because the XC90 has been winning a ton of awards for its world-class interior, and the same designers and the same attention to detail went into this interior. The Volvo and the Mercedes have the two best interiors in this segment, in my mind, but I think that the Mercedes-Benz interior is just a slight hair better than this interior. The catch is, that Mercedes-Benz interior will really cost you a lot of cash. It's going to be about $17,000 more expensive than a comparably equipped S90. And we're talking about the Mercedes-Benz E300, of course, which is the base E-Class model. So an E400, which would have performance more similar to this T6 all-wheel drive model that we're taking a look at, is going to be even more expensive when it finally comes out. I expect that to be right around $20,000 to $25,000 more expensive than this comparably equipped S90. And the S90's interior is only a tiny hair behind the Mercedes-Benz interior. The E-Class is in fact so much more expensive than the S90 when comparably equipped, I suspect you could get a T8 all-wheel drive plug-in electric hybrid version of the S90 when it finally comes out in 2017 for about the same price as a loaded E300 all-wheel drive. That's of course before we even talk about the Mercedes-Benz plug-in hybrid, which we do expect to see soon, or the E400, which is the more powerful version of that Mercedes-Benz E-Class. My top pick in this segment is the 2017 S90, however, there are a few conditions. Because the S90 really cannot compete directly with the turbocharged V8 competition that we see, definitely not with the performance competition like the M5 or the upcoming AMG versions of the E-Class or the S or RS versions of Audi's A6. Volvo just hasn't seemed to want to compete with that particular set with their vehicles. Even the upcoming T8 all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid that's about 400 horsepower is not really going to be a direct competitor to the twin-turbo V8s that we see 
especially from BMW. This is not a rear wheel drive vehicle. And if you get the T8 version of the vehicle, even though we have 400 horsepower total, only about 87 horsepower can go to the rear. So it still has a very strong front wheel bias. That's not going on over there with the BMW if you get all wheel drive or the Mercedes Benz if you get all wheel drive. But the reason that the Volvo is my top pick in the segment is that it has easily one of the best interiors and it's incredibly well priced. Again, this is about $10,000 less than a comparably equipped Audi, BMW, or Mercedes. This compares especially well, I think, to the brand new E300. Now, the Volvo is not gonna be as fast as the BMW or the Audi with the three liter engines in it. However, the Volvo is going to be notably faster than the BMW or the Audi with their two liter turbocharged engines. And that really is the sales proposition here. I think it's the more realistic cross shop. If you're shopping for a 528i or a base A6 with that two liter turbocharged engine, whether it's the front wheel drive one or the rear wheel drive one, you could get this much better equipped, faster, handles almost as well, for about the same price or even possibly less depending on how you configure them. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes. This has been the 2017 Volvo S90. Be sure and subscribe to this channel. Let me know what you think about it down there in the comment section and be sure to wait for our complete review when we get full performance specs on this vehicle back at home. I'll see you next week.